Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. We're in a series called Stories of Jesus, and to this point, we've been talking about healing stories, healing miracles. Today I want to talk about another very popular story of Jesus. I like it myself, but I want to start with a question. Have you ever asked God for something and then immediately regretted it? I'll give you an example. Have you ever been dumb enough to ask God for more patience? That is the dumbest thing that you can ever ask God for. Help me to have more patience. Because the only way you know if you got it is for your patience to be tested. And at that point, you find out that you did not get more patience. <laughs> you just got more aggravation, right? We're going to look at a story today where a Bible hero asks Jesus for something, and then immediately regrets his decision, immediately regrets it. It's in the story, it's in the book of Matthew. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Understand, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all still the old covenant, the, the Mosaic law, but it's just located in the New Testament. The story that we're going to look at uh, is also in the book of Mark and in the book of John, but the book of Matthew is the only book that says Peter walked on water. Peter walking on water is excluded from the other two books. Luke doesn't even talk about it at all. The other two books only say Jesus walked on the water. They never mention Peter walking on the water. Strange fact. We're going to dive into this. We're going to look at this today. It's in Matthew Chapter 14, verse 22, and it says, Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go on to the other side ahead of him while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake on top of the water when the disciples saw him walking on the lake they were terrified it's a ghost they said they cried out in fear but jesus immediately said to them take courage it is i do not be afraid now peter the big mouth he makes a request he's about to regret lord if it is you tell me to come out to you on the water and jesus says one word come Come. Come on, big mouth. <laughs> then Peter got down on the boat. He walks on the water. He does it. Walks on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind and the waves, he was afraid. And my man began to drown. He began to sink. Lord, save me, he cried out. Immediately, Jesus reached his hand out and caught him. And he said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Then he climbed in the boat and the winds died down. Then those that were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Let's break this whole story down. Let's do a deep dive study of what we're learning here. It says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get in the boat, go to the other side. This is the first time that Matthew uses the word immediately in conjunction to anything that Jesus is doing. Immediately, there's an urgency. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat, and he dismisses the crowd. What crowd? Well, the story right before this one is Jesus feeding the 5,000. So we know that there's at least 5,000 men, not counting women and children. That's a pretty big crowd. That's a pretty big crowd. So he's dismissing them all. But why does Jesus need to get away so urgently to pray? Well, a couple stories before this, if you read in the Bible, his cousin John had been murdered. His cousin John had been murdered. 
And Jesus hasn't had any time alone to grieve. He hasn't had time to process. So as much as he wants to be used by his father and feed 5,000 and do healings and miracles, he knows, I need to get alone. I need to pray. I need to spend some time to get refueled. So immediately he gets away. He dismisses himself from the crowds and spends time alone with the father to work through some stuff. I'm going to tell you, listen, if you are dealing with grief in your life, you're dealing with loss, don't know what to do, you're, you're feeling anger, you're feeling sad, you're feeling depressed, feeling anxious, all these things are normal emotions that come with grief. Go back and look at a series that I wrote several months ago, probably a year ago, called Good Grief. Good Grief. It's a series that my wife and I worked on, talking about how we can grieve in a way that's healthy and proper and biblical, right? So... Jesus was in kind of a rush, and I believe that it was because he knew that he needed to get alone and pray. And I just want to throw this out there to you guys. If God needs to pray, then we need to take some time to pray. Now, I'm going to throw this out there to you. I'm going to be completely honest and transparent. Your boy doesn't sit and pray for hours a day. Can't do it. Can't do it. My mind's all over the place. I don't know what to say. After about five minutes, ten minutes, I've worked through all the stuff I know to say. Right? So, but I'll pray multiple times a day. I'll take time throughout the day, get alone with God, take a walk. I love being outside. I love being in nature. And I'll just talk to the Lord, okay? Now, there are some things that there are formed prayers where you're praying for specific things on your prayer list. But there needs to be a time every single day that you get alone and talk with God, all right? Verse 24, later that night... He was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Let's break this down. This is, this is a really cool passage right here. Matthew tells us in the original text, if we go and look at the original manuscripts, he says that the boat was many stadia away, many stadia away from the land. In John 6.19 it talks about the same story, and John says that the boat was 25 or 30 stadia away, which to our English language and what we would say, that the boat was three to four miles away from shore. Three to four miles away from shore. At three miles, you can no longer see the shoreline. Because of the curvature of the earth, and being out in water, if you're looking back, you can no longer see the coastline from your boat. So they're kind of out there. They're a couple miles out from shore. And it's slightly odd that they would be where they are, that they would be that far out and not made it across. But remember Matthew told us that they were in a storm, that there was wind and there was waves, and they were in a sailboat. Do you know how hard it is to use a sailboat when the wind's blowing the wrong way? So they're all over the place, and it says that they had to row. So they probably dropped the sails, they got the oars out, and they're trying to fight these wind, this wind and fight the waves to try to get to where they're at. They, they've been blown off course. Again, the original text says that the time of day was the fourth watch of night, the fourth watch of night, or before dawn in our text today, the fourth watch of night. The fourth watch of night would be anywhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. If you've ever taken a road trip and you're going to drive through the night, try to do like the drive from New York to Florida in a 24-hour drive, you know how hard that 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. leg of the drive is. No one wants to have to do that one, right? I mean, I would even encourage you, like, plan your gas fill-ups anywhere other than 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. because it's tough. But in those hours, right, right up 5, 5.30, 6, the sun's coming up, like it could be. So, so Jesus is out there walking on this water, and it would be kind of hard to make out what was actually going on. 
And before any of us read this story and we're like, oh, what were they afraid of? Of course it was Jesus. All right, let's just think about this for a second. You're out on the Hudson River fishing some striped bass, and all of a sudden, somebody just goes walking straight across the Hudson River. That ain't going to bug you out? You're going to be like, what in the David Blaine is going on? Like, what kind of magician stuff is happening out here in Newburgh right now? It, listen, you might just be like, oh, it must be the Lord. <laughs> it must be Jesus in the Hudson Valley. No, it's going to bug you out. And the same thing with them. Like, what was he doing there? Why was he walking on water? Why? Why? And I promise you, listen, I'm not making this up, but I did deep, deep theological study. I did deep theological study on why did Jesus walk on the water. And there is no significant theological reason why he did it. And if there was a deep theological reason, it didn't work. Because his disciples were afraid. If there was a reason be, by doing it, he actually scared the piss out of them all. <laughs> Didn't work. Scared them. Early morning, Jesus walking on the water, and I, I think it's so cool that he could do it. And in fact, yo, if it was me, if I were Jesus, and it was dark out, and my boys were in a boat, I would have played it up. I'd be like, oh. <laughs> Verse 26, when the disciples saw him walk on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And I want you to hear that in your heart today. That when you find yourself in a situation that you're feeling scared, that you're feeling burdened, you're feeling overwhelmed maybe you got a bad report or something's actually happening in your body and you're scared can you hear the voice of your lord saying take courage i am here with you i am here with you i dissected this passage frontward and backward i read every commentary i could and the biggest conclusion we could come to as to why Jesus walked on the water was there's no more boats. There's no more boats. The disciples have taken the boat across. They're three miles away. He missed the boat. Now, you could swim or you could walk on water. And if you could walk on water, why not walk on water? Huh? Now, can I ask this question? Anybody been in church like their whole life since they were a kid? Okay, been in church your whole life since you were a kid. All right, so maybe you've done the same thing I've done. Because we were taught, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Huh? Yeah? All right, how many of you people who've been in church your whole life since you were a kid tried walking on water in your family swimming pool? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You get back on the patio as far as you can and run. I can do it. And see how far you can get. You take about one step and psh, you're sunk. Or you put the solar cover out. See how far you can run across the solar cover. Or a floaty. Can't walk on water. Cannot walk on water. Tried. I've tried. There's no reason why Jesus walked on water. There isn't. It's just he could. He could. So he did. It wasn't for them to learn something majestic and great because only one other person attempted it. If we really, really, really study out scripture, why did Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? Because he could. Because he was his friend and he could do it. So he did it. There's no theological reason why. He could and he did. Verse 28, Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, Tell me to come out on the water. And Jesus says, come. One word. One word. Come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water towards Jesus. Peter gets out of the boat. He walks 
on the water. I've preached this story before, and I brought a kiddie pool on stage. And I had a bunch of people come on stage and say, hey, man, walk on water. And every single one that took the shoes and socks off, stepped on the water, sank right to the bottom of the pool. They sank right to the bottom of the pool. They did not walk on water. And might I suggest and maybe even sound like a heretic for a few seconds until I get to my point and suggest that maybe Peter never actually walked on water? It's physically impossible to walk on water. It's, it, it defies gravity. It defies nature. It defies the densities of water and body mass. I will tell you this, if I tried to walk on water today, I would sink, although I'm a little bit more buoyant than I used to be, I'm still going to sink. Because humans can't walk on water. And might I suggest that Peter never did. That Peter never did walk on water. He walked on something more significant than water. He walked on something more eternal than water. He walked on something more solid than water, more uplifting than water. Might I suggest that Peter walked on the word? He walked on the word. In fact, he walked on one word, come. Come. And I tell you this story today to tell you why many Christians' prayers don't work. Many Christians' prayers don't work because they're not praying based on the word. They're not standing on a word. They're not standing on a scripture. They're not standing on a promise of God. They're begging God, hoping he hears them. That's when Peter sank. That's when Peter sank. Peter sank when he stepped off the word. Peter sank when he took his eyes off the word. He took his eyes off the word. And when he took his eyes off the word, he sank. Right? The book of John says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God. This is why a lot of us are not walking in faith. We're not walking above our problems and above our circumstances. Come on, just hear me. No judgment. But we don't know what the word is. We don't have a Bible verse. We don't have a scripture that lines up with what we're believing for. I mean, could you imagine a waiter or a waitress trying to take your order, but they don't know the menu? Could you imagine? You say to them, oh, I want the burrito, but what's in that? I don't know. It's a burrito. <laughs> well, I, I'm allergic to onions, so can you 86 the onions? 86 the onions? Yeah, 86 the onions. Add more guac. There's guac in it? But when I talk to Christians, this is how they are about their faith. Wait, I can do that? I, be I can believe God for that? Wait, the Bible says that? You know, I've been tempted to get up and actually preach a complete heretic sermon and see how many people actually catch me on it. Seriously. Like, if you believe what I say, like, let me just rephrase that. Please don't believe anything that I say. Don't believe a single word that I say, and if you ever go to a church where the guy says, you better do exactly what I say, run. Run, because it's a cult. Don't believe anything I say. Go look me up. Go into the Bible and prove me wrong. Know it for yourself, because that's the only time that you can stand on the word is when you know what the word is. Peter, just like us, can't walk on water, but he can walk on the word. He can walk by faith and not by sight. And the word sight doesn't just mean, the word sight when in that passage doesn't mean by what he sees. It means that he's not moved by his senses. The moment Peter 
became to, uh, became to be moved by his senses is when he sank. He's looking at Jesus. He's walking on the water. But then the wave hits him in the knee instead of the ankle. The wind blows a little bit harder on the right shoulder. The sound of the wind caught him in the back of the head. Hey, wait a second. Wait a second. I'm walking on water. Wait a second. I'm walking on water. The Lord gave Peter a word. Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the word. He got out of the boat and he was walking on the word. If you're trying to walk out a miracle in your life without a word, you better have a life vest. I'm going to say that again. That's good. Somebody needs to tweet that. If you're trying to walk out a miracle in your life without a word, you better have a life vest. No one can walk on the water, but we can all walk on a word. We can all walk on a word. A word from God, a scripture from God, the voice of God. You see, put this up on the screen. When the word gives you a word, one word is all you need. When the word gives you a word, one word is all you need. That's what the faith is. I heard this from God. I heard God say this to me. This scripture's for me. When I read this, it came alive to me. I know this is what God wants me to do. But, like Peter, he walks on the water for a hot second. And then Peter does what we're doing right now. I got, I got to just shift your brain for a second. Look at this passage from like 30 foot view. What we're doing right now is what a lot of churches do. We get hung up on Peter. We start studying the story of Peter. And the story in and of itself is telling us the danger of what we're doing right now. We're taking our eyes off the miracle of Jesus and putting it on Peter. And Peter takes his eyes off the miracle of Jesus and looks at the water. Wait, wait, did we not get that? <laughs> it's ironic. It's the story within a story. It's the, it's the circular definition of the story. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. Peter's not the point. Peter's not the miracle. Could that be why only the book of Matthew even talks about it? And the other two was like, well, Peter wasn't the point. Jesus was always the point. Jesus was always the focus. Yo, that's some good stuff. Verse 29, Peter gets down out of the boat. He walks on the water for a hot second. But when he saw, when his senses begin to fire information, his left brain and his right brain is saying, wait, 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 this doesn't make sense. When he's not feeling pressure under his feet. Anybody ever water skied before? Water ski? Have you ever water skied without skis? Just your bare feet? Yo, that joins a whole nother level. That's wild. All right? That's just not right. <laughs> but, I mean, you're literally walking on water, right? Your bare feet skipping across. But, like, you're on water, but it's not solid, but it's holding you up. And his senses, his left brain and his right brain and his body and the waves, when he saw, when he came to his senses, he was afraid. He began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, second time, the word immediately is used in Matthew. Immediately, Jesus reached his hand out and caught him. Because Jesus was right there. He was right there in the storm. He was right there in the wind. He was right there when Peter was walking on the water. And he's right there while Peter's sinking. He didn't run from him. God is not afraid of your failure. God ain't afraid of you. Yes, I got to tell you a story one time. One time I was a youth pastor, and one of my teens invited me over to his house for his grad party. He said, Pastor Mike, can you bring some firewood for the grad party so we can have a little bonfire? And I'm like, yeah, no problem. So I bring like a whole, a whole cord, cord of firewood to this party so we can have a nice bonfire. Okay, so we unload all the wood, we put in the pot, like put in a pile. Now I think that they're just going to use that pile and feed 
The bonfire. Yo! They took gasoline. Poured it on the whole thing and lit it. Lit it. Flames are shooting 50 feet in the air. It's catching the tree limbs on fire all around. And we're like, <laughs> like we're bugging out, right? All of a sudden, one of the neighbors calls the cops. The cops show up. The fire department shows up. Well, here's my story. This is what I'll tell you. Well, this kid went to a school, and the principal was there. And the principal was like, yo, cops are showing up. I can't be seen here. I'm out of here. Dude jumps in his car and takes off. And I told him, hey, listen, I'm not going to abandon you. I'm ride or die, baby. I'm ride or die with you, okay? So I'm like, go get the hose. So he runs up to the house. He gets the hose. The hose has no water pressure. So we're sitting there like, like, it was just a mess. Fire department comes. They pull out the fire hose. They make us torch the whole thing, you know, put the whole thing down with the water, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, but that's not what Jesus did. Jesus wasn't like, dang, that's a shame. <laughs> Had a lot of hope for you, Peter. I need to swim, boy. Anybody learn how to swim like that? Your dad just threw you in a pool and made you swim? Swim, boy. Right? But Jesus didn't do that. He stood there in the middle of his failure, in the middle of taking his eyes off, and he grabs him, and he picks him back up. He says, why'd you doubt? Why'd you doubt? But here's the miracle and the part that we miss when we're talking even about Peter. He slipped, he sank, but he rose. How did he get back to the boat? He walked on the water back. He walked out and he walked back. I ain't never been able to do it. I'm 43 years old. I still try to walk on my swimming pool. He did it. He did it with Jesus because Jesus was right there with him the whole time. We in our own lives need to keep our eyes on the word. We need to keep our eyes on the word. I don't care. Listen, I don't care how far you think you are from God in your life. I don't care how tired you are of hearing about the Bible and needing to hear the Bible and read. I don't care. You can hear one more time. Because every single one of us need a word. Every single one of us need a word for our future. Somebody in here dealing with anxiety, all you need to hear is peace. Maybe someone in here today has got some marital problems, and all you need to hear is stay. Maybe someone in here is bugging out about their future and all they need to hear is trust. Maybe someone trying to hear a word from God for their job and all they need to hear is leave. Maybe someone's pretty scared about their health and the word you need to hear from God is live. Sometimes all you need to hear about your finances is I will provide. See, we all need a word. And when we get the word, it's enough to stand on. It's enough to stand on. We can stand on the word. We can't stand on water. We can stand on the word. Now, am I saying that Peter didn't walk on water? No, I'm not saying that. He walked on water. But I'm saying the spiritual premise underlying that is that he was walking on faith walking on the word of God. And when he took his eyes out of faith and into doubt, that's when the problem came. You see, it's not always going to be a detailed list of what we need to do. Sometimes we're just going to get a vague word from God, a vague sensing, an inward knowing that it's something that we need to do. But here's the issue today. Here's the issue today. Even if we thought we heard God, would we do what we thought we heard him say? I'm going to give you an example. In the book of Exodus, God appears to Abraham. And he says, Abraham, go to a place that I will show you or I will tell you. So Abraham, by faith, 
packed his family up, got rid of all his belongings, and went, not knowing where he was to go. God says, I'll show you along the way. Now, hold up. Let's just think about it right now, 2022. God says, go, and I'll show you where to go. Wait, wait, wait. Quit my job, sell my house, pack up my three children and my three dogs, and just go? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. I'm just saying, who's doing that today? Before you think you're all faith, don't, 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 don't do that. Don't, 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 don't try to outshine your faith because God's told you to diet and change your habits and you haven't. Let alone sell your house and move away, not knowing, what do I put in the GPS? Just start driving. Are you kidding me? I'm just saying, I'm just wondering, because I'm looking at these stories of Jesus, and we want all the miracles. But do we want the obedience? Do we really, really, can God, can God really do what he wants to do in the land today through us? I don't know. And I'm not trying to be more skeptical, but I don't know. Because following God sometimes inconvenient. It's inconvenient. And I think that we want to accept his grace and his mercy and all these things because those fit into our decisions. But does it fit into our decisions to daily get a word from God? He says this is our daily bread. Daily bread. Now unless you're intermittent fasting, you ain't trying to miss meals. But how do we think we can miss a spiritual meal of daily bread from the Lord? We have to get a word. My question to you is this, as I close out, this is kind of the takeaway. Would you come to where God is calling you this weekend? Would you come to where he's calling you? If it meant leaving the comforts of your boat. See, the comforts of the boat is certainty. Certainty. Peter left certainty and stepped out to uncertainty. Because no one in all of history had ever walked on water. Could it be that maybe God's calling you into a new season of your spiritual life? Maybe some of you are moving from retirement to refirement. And God wants to use you in a new season of refirement. The older teaching the younger. That there's something within you that someone else needs to know before your life is over. Maybe it's a new season. A new step and God's saying, come. Come to me. Well, Pastor Mike, how can you see this? How can you see that God wants to do some new things? Hey, listen. When the waves are rising and storms are approaching, when the waves are rising and the storms are approaching, it also means that Jesus is on the move. You say, but where, where, are the, where are the wind and where are the waves? The Bible says in the last days there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be pestilence and earthquakes and world destruction. And if, hey, listen, if you don't see this playing out today, the Bible says in the book of Jude, in the last days, they'll be forbidden to marry. If you don't see that coming, with everything else that's being voted on, come on. Just got to read the back of the book. See what's coming. Wind and waves are coming. That also means that Jesus is in the midst. Jesus is in the midst. That means that he wants to position people and move them in the right places. And listen, fear is going to try to grab us. We're not going to move by fear. We're not going to make decisions based on fear. I make decisions based on the word and what the word of God leads us and guides us to do. Pastor Mike, I just, I have these deep problems, these deep issues. That's great because it's out in the deep waters that troubles get drowned. It's out in the deep waters that troubles get drowned. If you want to stay up on the shore where your trouble can stand as well, you can't drown it there. Your troubles get drowned out in the place that you can't touch the bottom either. That's where trust comes in. That's where faith comes in. God, I don't feel 
you, I don't see you, I don't sense what's happening, but I'm going to step out in faith. That's a deep place to be in. And that's the place that he can do some work on you. Maybe you're here today and you need to step out on a word called Romans 10.9. Romans 10.9 says, if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you would be saved. Maybe that's a word that someone needs to step out on today. Maybe you're watching online and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Well, maybe if you stepped out on this word today, Step out on that passage today. He would hold you up. He would lift you up. Maybe someone needs to step out on a word today that by his stripes you are healed. I'm feeling something that, that someone's been through something recently and I'm just, I, I want you to know by faith that you will not have long lasting symptoms from that diagnosis. That although your body was a, uh, 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 overtaken and, and beat up, you will not have long-lasting effects in your body. They, those symptoms are going to be moving on and releasing from your body in the name of Jesus. Maybe you need to step out on that word. And not being afraid that you're going to feel the way you've been feeling forever. Maybe you need to take a step of faith in your finances, your marriage. Maybe something's going on with your children. Your children aren't living the way that you raised them to live. And maybe you need to step out on faith on that. If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never taken that step of faith to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, that's the starting point. That's the starting point. That's the gate. That gets us into that place that everything else in the Bible is ours. If you're here today or you're watching online, you need to take that step. We'd like to walk that walk with you this morning, hand in hand, just like Jesus and Peter. And we do that by saying this prayer. That prayer is this, confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart. And it goes like this, dear God. I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.